The moon's actual distance from the earth was the first thing to be attended to. Now the mean or average interval between the centers of the two planets is 59.9643 of the earth's equatorial radii or about 237,000 miles. I say the mean or average interval but it must be borne in mind that the form of the moon's orbit being an ellipse of eccentricity amounting to no less than 0 0.05484 of the major semi-axis of the ellipse itself and the Earth's center being situated in its focus, if I could in any manner contrive to meet the moon, as it were, in its perigee, the above-mentioned distance would be materially diminished. But to say nothing at present of this possibility, it was very certain that, at all events, from the 237,000 miles, I would have to deduct the radius of the Earth, say 4,000, and the radius of the moon, say 1,080, in all 5,080, leaving an actual interval to be traversed under average circumstances of 231,920 miles. Now this, I reflected, was no very extraordinary distance. Traveling on land has been repeatedly accomplished at the rate of 30 miles per hour, and indeed a much greater speed may be anticipated, but even at this velocity it would take me no more than 322 days to reach the surface of the moon. There were, however, many particulars inducing me to believe that my average rate of traveling might possibly very much exceed that of 30 miles per hour, and, as these considerations did not fail to make a deep impression upon my mind, I will mention them more fully hereafter. The next point to be regarded was a matter of far greater importance. From indications afforded by the barometer, we find that in ascensions from the surface of the earth we have, at the height of 1,000 feet, left below us about one-thirtieth of the entire mass of atmospheric air. That at 10,600 we have ascended through nearly one-third, and that at 18,000, which is not far from the elevation of Cotopaxi, we have surmounted one-half the material, or, at all events, one-half the ponderable body of air incumbent upon our globe. It is also calculated that at an altitude not exceeding the hundredth part of the Earth's diameter, that is, not exceeding 80 miles, the rarefication would be so excessive that animal life could in no manner be sustained, and, moreover, that the most delicate means we possess of ascertaining the presence of the atmosphere would be inadequate to assure us of its existence. But I did not fail to perceive that these latter calculations are founded altogether on our experimental knowledge of the properties of air, and the mechanical laws regulating its dilation and compression in what may be called, comparatively speaking, the immediate vicinity of the earth itself. And, at the same time, it is taken for granted that animal life is, and must be, essentially incapable of modification at any given unattainable distance from the surface. Now all such reasoning, and from such data, must, of course, be simply analogical. The greatest height ever reached by man was that of 25,000 feet, attained in the aeronautic expedition of Messrs. Guy Lussac and Biot. This is a moderate altitude, even when compared with the 80 miles in question, and I could not help thinking that the subject admitted room for doubt and great latitude for speculation. But, in point of fact, an ascension being made to any given altitude, the ponderable quantity of air surmounted in any farther ascension is by no means in proportion to the additional height ascended, as may be plainly seen from what has been stated before but in a ratio constantly decreasing. It is therefore evident that, ascend as high as we may, we cannot, literally speaking, arrive at a limit beyond which no atmosphere is to be found. It must exist, I argued, although it may exist in a state of infinite rarefication. On the other hand, I was aware that arguments have not been wanting to prove the existence of a real and definite limit to the atmosphere, beyond which there is absolutely no air whatsoever. But a circumstance which has been left out of view by those who contend for such a limit seemed to me, although no positive refutation of their creed, still a point worthy very serious investigation. 
on comparing the intervals between the successive arrivals of Encke's comet at its perihelion, after giving credit in the most exact manner for all the disturbances due to the attractions of the planets, it appears that the periods are gradually diminishing. That is to say, the major axis of the comet's ellipse is growing shorter in a slow but perfectly regular decrease. Now this is precisely what ought to be the case if we suppose a resistance experienced from the comet from an extremely rare ethereal medium pervading the regions of its orbit. For it is evident that such a medium must, in retarding the comet's velocity, increase its centripetal by weakening its centrifugal force. In other words, the sun's attraction would be constantly attaining greater power and the comet would be drawn nearer at every revolution. Indeed, there is no other way of accounting for the variation in question. But again, the real diameter of the same comet's nebulosity is observed to contract rapidly as it approaches the sun and dilate with equal rapidity in its departure toward its aphelion. Was I not justifiable in supposing, with M. Valls, that this apparent condensation of volume has its origin in the compression of the same ethereal medium I have spoken of before, and which is only denser in proportion to its solar vicinity? The lenticular-shaped phenomenon, also called the zodiacal light, was a matter worthy of attention. This radiance, so apparent in the tropics, and which cannot be mistaken for any meteoric luster, extends from the horizon obliquely upward and follows generally the direction of the sun's equator. It appeared to me evidently in the nature of a rare atmosphere extending from the sun outward, beyond the orbit of Venus at least, and I believed indefinitely farther. Indeed, this medium I could not suppose confined to the path of the comet's ellipse or to the immediate neighborhood of the sun. It was easy, on the contrary, to imagine it pervading the entire regions of our planetary system, condensed into what we call atmosphere at the planets themselves, and perhaps at some of them modified by considerations, so to speak, purely geological. Having adopted this view of the subject, I had little further hesitation, granting that on my passage I should meet with atmosphere essentially the same as at the surface of the earth, I conceived that, by means of the very ingenious apparatus of M. Grimm, I should readily be enabled to condense it in sufficient quantity for the purposes of respiration. This would remove the chief obstacle in a journey to the moon. I had indeed spent some money and great labor in adapting the apparatus to the object intended and confidently looked forward to its successful application. If I could manage to complete the voyage within any reasonable period. This brings me back to the rate at which it might be possible to travel. It is true that balloons, in the first stage of their ascensions from the earth, are known to rise with a velocity comparatively moderate. Now the power of elevation lies altogether in the superior lightness of the gas in the balloon compared with the atmospheric air, and at first sight it does not appear probable that, as the balloon acquires altitude and consequently arrives successively in atmospheric strata of densities rapidly diminishing, I say it does not appear at all reasonable that, in this, its progress upwards, the original velocity should be accelerated. On the other hand, I was not aware that, in any recorded ascension, a diminution was apparent in the absolute rate of ascent although such should have been the case if on account of nothing else, on account of the escape of gas through balloons ill-constructed and varnished with no better material than the ordinary varnish. It seemed, therefore, that the effect of such escape was only sufficient to counterbalance the effect of some accelerating power. I now considered that, provided in my passage, I found the medium I had imagined, and provided that it should prove to be actually and essentially what we denominate atmospheric air, it could make comparatively little difference at what extreme state of rarefication I should discover it. That is to say, in regard to my power of ascending, for the gas in the balloon would not only be itself subject to rarefication partially similar, in proportion to the occurrence of which I could suffer an escape of so much as would be requisite to prevent explosion, 
but being what it was would at all events continue specifically lighter than any compound whatever of mere nitrogen and oxygen in the meantime the force of gravitation would be constantly diminishing in proportion to the squares of the distances and thus with a velocity prodigiously accelerating i should at length arrive in those distant regions where the force of the earth's attraction would be superseded by that of the moon in accordance with these ideas i did not think it worth while to encumber myself with more provisions than would be sufficient for a period of forty days there was still however another difficulty which occasioned me some little disquietude. It has been observed that, in balloon ascensions to any considerable height, besides the pain attending respiration, great uneasiness is experienced about the head and body, often accompanied with bleeding at the nose and other symptoms of an alarming kind, and growing more and more inconvenient in proportion to the altitude attained. This was a reflection of a nature somewhat startling, was it not probable that these symptoms would increase indefinitely, or at least until terminated by death itself? I finally thought not. Their origin was to be looked for in the progressive removal of the customary atmospheric pressure upon the surface of the body, and consequent distension of the superficial blood vessels, not in any positive disorganization of the animal system, as in the case of difficulty in breathing, where the atmospheric density is chemically insufficient for the due renovation of blood in a ventricle of the heart. Unless, for default of this renovation, I could see no reason, therefore, why life could not be sustained even in a vacuum, for the expansion and compression of chest, commonly called breathing, is action purely muscular, and the cause, not the effect, of respiration. In a word, I conceived that as the body should become habituated to the want of atmospheric pressure, the sensations of pain would gradually diminish, and to endure them while they continued, I relied with confidence upon the iron hardihood of my constitution. Thus, may it please your excellencies, I have detailed some though by no means all, the considerations which led me to form the project of a lunar voyage. I shall now proceed to lay before you the result of an attempt so apparently audacious in conception and, at all events, so utterly unparalleled in the annals of mankind. Having attained the altitude before mentioned, that is to say three miles and three quarters, I threw out from the car a quantity of feathers and found that I still ascended with sufficient rapidity. There was, therefore, no necessity for discharging any ballast. I was glad of this, for I wished to retain with me as much weight as I could carry, for reasons which will be explained in the sequel. I, as yet, suffered no bodily inconvenience, breathing with great freedom and feeling no pain whatever in the head. The cat was lying very demurely upon my coat, which I had taken off, and eyeing the pigeons with an air of nonchalance these latter being tied by the leg to prevent their escape, were busily employed in picking up some grains of rice scattered for them in the bottom of the car. At twenty minutes past six o'clock the barometer showed an elevation of twenty-six thousand four hundred feet, or five miles to a fraction. The prospect seemed unbounded. Indeed, it is very easily calculated by means of spherical geometry what a great extent of the earth's area I beheld. The convex surface of any segment of a sphere is, to the entire surface of the sphere itself, as the versed sine of the segment to the diameter of the sphere. Now, in my case, the versed sine, that is to say the thickness of the segment beneath me, was about equal to my elevation, or the elevation of the point of sight above the surface. As five miles, then, to eight thousand would express the proportion of the Earth's area seen by me. In other words, I beheld as much as a sixteen hundredth part of the whole surface of the globe. The sea appeared unruffled as a mirror, although, by means of the spyglass, I could perceive it to be in a state of violent agitation. The ship was no longer visible, having drifted away, apparently to the eastward. I now began to experience, at intervals, severe pain in the head, especially about the ears, still, however, breathing with tolerable freedom. The cat and pigeons seemed to suffer no inconvenience whatsoever. 
At twenty minutes before seven, the balloon entered a long series of dense clouds, which put me in great trouble by damaging my condensing apparatus and wetting me to the skin. This was, to be sure, a singular rencontre, for I had not believed it possible that a cloud of this nature could be sustained at so great an elevation. I thought it best, however, to throw out two five-pound pieces of ballast, reserving still a weight of one hundred and sixty-five pounds. Upon so doing, I soon rose above the difficulty and perceived immediately that I had obtained a great increase in my rate of ascent. In a few seconds after my leaving the cloud, a flash of vivid lightning shot from one end of it to the other and caused it to kindle up throughout its vast extent like a mass of ignited and glowing charcoal. This, it must be remembered, was in the broad light of day. No fancy may picture the sublimity which might have been exhibited by a similar phenomenon taking place amid the darkness of the night. Hell itself might have been found a fitting image. Even as it was, my hair stood on end while I gazed afar down within the yawning abysses, letting imagination descend, as it were, and stalk about in the strange vaulted halls and ruddy gulfs and red ghastly chasms of the hideous and unfathomable fire. I had indeed made a narrow escape. Had the balloon remained a very short while longer within the cloud, that is to say, had not the inconvenience of getting wet determined me to discharge the ballast, inevitable ruin would have been the consequence. Such perils, although little considered, are perhaps the greatest which must be encountered in balloons. I had by this time, however, attained too great an elevation to be any longer uneasy on this head. I was now rising rapidly, and by seven o'clock the barometer indicated an altitude of no less than nine miles and a half. I began to find great difficulty in drawing my breath. My head, too, was excessively painful, and, Having felt for some time a moisture about my cheeks, I at length discovered it to be blood, which was oozing quite fast from the drums of my ears. My eyes also gave me great uneasiness. Upon passing the hand over them, they seemed to have protruded from their sockets in no inconsiderable degree, and all objects in the car, and even the balloon itself, appeared distorted to my vision. These symptoms were more than I had expected, and occasioned me some alarm. At this juncture, very imprudently and without consideration, I threw out from the car three five-pound pieces of ballast. The accelerated rate of ascent thus obtained carried me too rapidly and without sufficient gradation into a highly rarefied stratum of the atmosphere, and the result had nearly proved fatal to my expedition and to myself. I was suddenly seized with a spasm which lasted for more than five minutes, and even when this, in a measure, ceased, I could catch my breath only at long intervals and in a gasping manner, bleeding all the while copiously at the nose and ears, and even slightly at the eyes. The pigeons appeared distressed in the extreme, and struggled to escape, while the cat mewed piteously, and, with her tongue hanging out of her mouth, staggered to and fro in the car, as if under the influence of poison. I now too late discovered the great rashness of which I had been guilty in discharging the ballast, and my agitation was excessive. I anticipated nothing less than death, and death in a few minutes. The physical suffering I underwent contributed also to render me nearly incapable of making any exertion for the preservation of my life. I had indeed little power of reflection left, and the violence of the pain in my head seemed to be greatly on the increase. Thus I found that my senses would shortly give way altogether, and I had already clutched one of the valve ropes with the view of attempting a descent, when the recollection of the trick I had played the three creditors, and the possible consequences to myself should I return, operated to deter me for the moment. I lay down in the bottom of the car and endeavored to collect my faculties. In this I so far succeeded as to determine upon the experiment of losing blood. Having no lancet, however, I was constrained to perform the operation in the best manner I was able, and finally succeeded in opening a vein in my right arm with the blade of my penknife. The blood had hardly commenced flowing when I experienced a sensible relief, and, by the time I had lost about half a moderate basin full, most of the worst symptoms had abandoned me entirely. 
I nevertheless did not think it expedient to attempt getting on my feet immediately. But, having tied up my arm as well I could, I lay still for about a quarter of an hour. At the end of this time I arose and found myself freer from absolute pain of any kind than I had been during the last hour and a quarter of my ascension. The difficulty of breathing, however, was diminished in a very slight degree, and I found that it would soon be positively necessary to make use of my condenser. In the meantime, looking toward the cat, who was again snugly stowed away upon my coat, I discovered, to my infinite surprise, that she had taken the opportunity of my indisposition to bring into light a litter of three little kittens. This was an addition to the number of passengers on my part altogether unexpected, but I was pleased at the occurrence. It would afford me a chance of bringing to a kind of test the truth of a surmise, which, more than anything else, had influenced me in attempting this ascension. I had imagined that the habitual endurance of the atmospheric pressure at the surface of the earth was the cause, or nearly so, of the pain attending animal existence at a distance above the surface. Should the kittens be found to suffer uneasiness in an equal degree with their mother, I must consider my theory in fault. But a failure to do so I should look upon as a strong confirmation of my idea. By eight o'clock I had actually attained an elevation of seventeen miles above the surface of the earth. Thus it seemed to me evident that my rate of ascent was not only on the increase, but that the progression would have been apparent in a slight degree even had I not discharged the ballast which I did. The pains in my head and ears returned, at intervals, with violence, and I still continued to bleed occasionally at the nose. But upon the whole I suffered much less than might have been expected. I breathed, however, at every moment, with more and more difficulty and each inhalation was attended with a troublesome spasmodic action of the chest. I now unpacked the condensing apparatus and got it ready for immediate use. The view of the earth at this period of my ascension was beautiful indeed. To the westward, the northward, and the southward, as far as I could see, lay a boundless sheet of apparently unruffled ocean, which every moment gained a deeper and a deeper tint of blue and began already to assume a slight appearance of convexity. At a vast distance to the eastward, although perfectly discernible, extended the islands of Great Britain, the entire Atlantic coasts of France and Spain, with a small portion of the northern part of the continent of Africa. Of individual edifices not a trace could be discovered, and the proudest cities of mankind had utterly faded away from the face of the earth. From the rock of Gibraltar now dwindled into a dim speck, the dark Mediterranean sea, dotted with shining islands as the heaven is dotted with stars, spread itself out to the eastward as far as my vision extended, until its entire mass of waters seemed at length to tumble headlong over the abyss of the horizon, and I found myself listening on tiptoe for the echoes of the mighty cataract. Overhead the sky was of a jetty black and the stars were brilliantly visible. The pigeons about this time, seeming to undergo much suffering, I determined upon giving them their liberty. I first untied one of them, a beautiful gray mottled pigeon, and placed him upon the rim of the wicker work. He appeared extremely uneasy, looking anxiously around him, fluttering his wings and making a loud cooing noise, but could not be persuaded to trust himself from off the car. I took him up at last, and threw him to about half a dozen yards from the balloon. He made, however, no attempt to descend, as I had expected, but struggled with great vehemence to get back, uttering at the same time very shrill and piercing cries. He at length succeeded in regaining his former station on the rim, but had hardly done so when his head dropped upon his breast, and he fell dead within the car. The other one did not prove so unfortunate. To prevent his following the example of his companion and accomplishing a return, I threw him downward with all my force, and was pleased to find him continue his descent with great velocity, making use of his wings with ease and in a perfectly natural manner. In a very short time he was out of sight, and I had no doubt he reached home in safety. Puss, who seemed in a great measure recovered from her illness, now made a hearty meal of the dead bird, and then went to sleep with much apparent satisfaction. 
Her kittens were quite lively, and so far evinced not the slightest sign of any uneasiness whatever. At a quarter past eight, being no longer able to draw breath without the most intolerable pain, I proceeded forthwith to adjust around the car the apparatus belonging to the condenser. This apparatus will require some little explanation, and your excellencies will please to bear in mind that my object in the first place was to surround myself and cat entirely with a barricade against the highly rarefied atmosphere in which I was existing with the intention of introducing within this barricade, by means of my condenser, a quantity of this same atmosphere sufficiently condensed for the purposes of respiration. With this object in view, I had prepared a very strong, perfectly airtight but flexible gum elastic bag. In this bag, which was of sufficient dimensions, the entire car was in a manner placed, that is to say, it, the bag, was drawn over the whole bottom of the car, up its sides, and so on, along the outside of the ropes, to the upper rim or hoop where the network is attached. Having pulled the bag up in this way and formed a complete enclosure on all sides and at bottom, it was now necessary to fasten up its top or mouth by passing its material over the hoop of the network, in other words, between the network and the hoop but if the network were separated from the hoop to admit this passage, what was to sustain the car in the meantime? Now the network was not permanently fastened to the hoop, but attached by a series of running loops or nooses. I therefore undid only a few of these loops at one time, leaving the car suspended by the remainder. Having thus inserted a portion of the cloth, forming the upper part of the bag, I refastened the loops. Not to the hoop, for that would have been impossible, since the cloth now intervened, but to a series of large buttons affixed to the cloth itself, about three feet below the mouth of the bag, the intervals between the buttons having been made to correspond to the intervals between the loops. This done, a few more of the loops were unfastened from the rim, a farther portion of the cloth introduced, and the disengaged loops then connected with their proper buttons. In this way it was possible to insert the whole upper part of the bag between the network and the hoop. It is evident that the hoop would now drop down within the car, while the whole weight of the car itself, with all its contents, would be held up merely by the strength of the buttons. This, at first sight, would seem an inadequate dependence. But it was by no means so, for the buttons were not only very strong in themselves, but so close together that a very slight portion of the whole weight was supported by any one of them. Indeed, had the car and contents been three times heavier than they were, I should not have been at all uneasy. I now raised up the hoop again within the covering of gum elastic and propped it at nearly its former height by means of three light poles prepared for the occasion. This was done, of course, to keep the bag distended at the top and to preserve the lower part of the network in its proper situation. All that now remained was to fasten up the mouth of the enclosure, and this was readily accomplished by gathering the folds of the material together and twisting them up very tightly on the inside by means of a kind of stationary tourniquet. In the sides of the covering thus adjusted round the car had been inserted three circular panes of thick but clear glass through which I could see without difficulty around me in every horizontal direction. In that portion of the cloth forming the bottom was likewise a fourth window of the same kind and corresponding with a small aperture in the floor of the car itself. This enabled me to see perpendicularly down, but having found it impossible to place any similar contrivance overhead on account of the peculiar manner of closing up the opening there and the consequent wrinkles in the cloth, I could expect to see no objects situated directly in my zenith. This, of course, was a matter of little consequence, for had I even been able to place a window at top, the balloon itself would have prevented my making any use of it. About a foot below one of the side windows was a circular opening, eight inches in diameter, and fitted with a brass rim adapted in its inner edge to the windings of a screw. In this rim was screwed the large tube of the condenser, the body of the machine being, of course, within the chamber of gum elastic. Through this tube a quantity of the rare atmosphere circumjacent being drawn by means of a vacuum created in the body of the machine 
was thence discharged in a state of condensation to mingle with the thin air already in the chamber. This operation, being repeated several times at length, filled the chamber with atmosphere proper for all the purposes of respiration. But in so confined a space it would, in a short time, necessarily become foul and unfit for use from frequent contact with the lungs. It was then ejected by a small valve at the bottom of the car, the dense air readily sinking into the thinner atmosphere below. To avoid the inconvenience of making a total vacuum at any moment within the chamber, this purification was never accomplished all at once, but in a gradual manner, the valve being opened only for a few seconds, then closed again, until one or two strokes from the pump of the condenser had supplied the place of the atmosphere ejected. For the sake of experiment, I had put the cat and kittens in a small basket and suspended it outside the car to a button at the bottom, close by the valve, through which I could feed them at any moment when necessary. I did this at some little risk, and before closing the mouth of the chamber, by reaching under the car with one of the poles before mentioned, to which a hook had been attached. By the time I had fully completed these arrangements and filled the chamber as explained, it wanted only ten minutes of nine o'clock. During the whole period of my being thus employed, I endured the most terrible distress from difficulty of respiration, and bitterly did I repent the negligence, or rather foolhardiness, of which I had been guilty, of putting off to the last moment a matter of so much importance. But having at length accomplished it, I soon began to reap the benefit of my invention. Once again I breathed with perfect freedom and ease, and indeed, why should I not? I was also agreeably surprised to find myself in a great measure relieved from the violent pains which had hitherto tormented me. A slight headache accompanied with the sensation of fullness or distension about the wrists, the ankles, and the throat was nearly all of which I had now to complain. Thus it seemed evident that a greater part of the uneasiness attending the removal of atmospheric pressure had actually worn off, as I had expected and that much of the pain endured for the last two hours should have been attributed altogether to the effects of a deficient respiration. At twenty minutes before nine o'clock, that is to say, a short time prior to my closing up the mouth of the chamber, the mercury attained its limit, or ran down in the barometer, which, as I mentioned before, was one of an extended construction. It then indicated an altitude on my part of 132,000 feet, or five and twenty miles, and I consequently surveyed at that time an extent of the earth's area amounting to no less than the three hundred and twentieth part of its entire superficies. At nine o'clock I had again lost sight of land to the eastward, but not before I became aware that the balloon was drifting rapidly to the north-northwest. The convexity of the ocean beneath me was very evident indeed although my view was often interrupted by the masses of cloud which floated to and fro. I observed now that even the lightest vapors never rose to more than ten miles above the level of the sea. At half past nine I tried the experiment of throwing out a handful of feathers through the valve. They did not float as I had expected, but dropped down perpendicularly like a bullet and mass and with the greatest velocity being out of sight in a very few seconds. I did not at first know what to make of this extraordinary phenomenon, not being able to believe that my rate of ascent had, of a sudden, met with so prodigious an acceleration. But it soon occurred to me that the atmosphere was now far too rare to sustain even the feathers, that they actually fell, as they appeared to do, with great rapidity, and that I had been surprised by the united velocities of their descent and my own elevation. By ten o'clock I found that I had very little to occupy my immediate attention. Affairs went swimmingly, and I believed the balloon to be going upward with the speed increasing momently, although I had no longer any means of ascertaining the progression of the increase. I suffered no pain or uneasiness of any kind, and enjoyed better spirits than I had at any period since my departure from Rotterdam busying myself now in examining the state of my various apparatus, and now in regenerating the atmosphere within the chamber. 
This latter point I determined to attend to at regular intervals of 40 minutes, more on account of the preservation of my health than from so frequent a renovation being absolutely necessary. In the meanwhile, I could not help making anticipations. Fancy reveled in the wild and dreamy regions of the moon. Imagination, feeling herself for once unshackled, roamed at will among the ever-changing wonders of a shadowy and unstable land. Now there were hoary and time-honored forests and craggy precipices, and waterfalls tumbling with a loud noise into abysses without a bottom. Then I came suddenly into still noonday solitudes, where no wind of heaven ever intruded, and where vast meadows of poppies and slender lily-looking flowers spread themselves out a weary distance, all silent and motionless forever. Then again I journeyed far down away into another country, where it was all one dim and vague lake, with a boundary line of clouds, and out of this melancholy water arose a forest of tall eastern trees, like a wilderness of dreams. And I have in mind that the shadows of the trees which fell upon the lake remained not on the surface where they fell, but sunk slowly and steadily down, and commingled with the waves, while from the trunks of the trees other shadows were continually coming out, and taking the place of their brothers thus entombed. This then, I said thoughtfully, is the very reason why the waters of this lake grow blacker with age and more melancholy as the hours run on. But fancies such as these were not the sole possessors of my brain. Horrors of a nature most stern and most appalling would too frequently obtrude themselves upon my mind and shake the innermost depths of my soul with the bare supposition of their possibility. Yet I would not suffer my thoughts for any length of time to dwell upon these latter speculations rightly judging the real and palpable dangers of the voyage sufficient for my undivided attention. At five o'clock p.m., being engaged in regenerating the atmosphere within the chamber, I took that opportunity of observing the cat and kittens through the valve. The cat herself appeared to suffer again very much, and I had no hesitation in attributing her uneasiness chiefly to a difficulty in breathing. But my experiment with the kittens had resulted very strangely. I had expected, of course, to see them betray a sense of pain, although in a less degree than their mother, and this would have been sufficient to confirm my opinion concerning the habitual endurance of atmospheric pressure, but I was not prepared to find them, upon close examination, evidently enjoying a high degree of health, breathing with the greatest ease and perfect regularity, and evincing not the slightest sign of any uneasiness whatever. I could only account for all this by extending my theory and supposing that the highly rarefied atmosphere around might perhaps not be, as I had taken for granted, chemically insufficient for the purposes of life, and that a person born in such a medium might, possibly, be unaware of any inconvenience attending its inhalation, while, upon removal to the denser strata near the earth, he might endure tortures of a similar nature to those I had so lately experienced. It has since been to me a matter of deep regret that an awkward accident at this time occasioned me the loss of my little family of cats, and deprived me of the insight into this matter which a continued experiment might have afforded. In passing my hand through the valve with a cup of water for the old puss, the sleeves of my shirt became entangled in the loop which sustained the basket, and thus, in a moment, loosened it from the bottom. Had the hole actually vanished into air, it could not have shot from my sight in a more abrupt and instantaneous manner. Positively, there could not have intervened the tenth part of a second between the disengagement of the basket and its absolute and total disappearance with all that it contained. My good wishes followed it to the earth. But, of course, I had no hope that either cat or kittens would ever live to tell the tale of their misfortune. End of The Unparalleled Adventures of One Hans Fall, Part 2